and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. Now it's time for Kit Corner, where we shine a spotlight on artists who've created products with the film and television industry in mind. Products designed by artists for artists. Hey, Brian. Hi, Jamie. How are you? Hey, good. Now, you have a product line called Got Flesh Prosthetics. So tell me, how did that all get started? The Got Flesh Prosthetic line started with a conversation with Nigel at Nigel's Beauty Emporium. He was opening up his own store, and he wanted to have some products that were kind of inherent to just his uh, location. I had a whole pile of scars, cut gash mold. So we discussed me providing this product line for his store. And it's kind of grown into what it is now. That's very cool. Now, are they easy to apply in color? The Gut Flesh prosthetic transfers are very easy to apply. They go on basically like a kid's tattoo. It goes on with water. Everything in the kit is there that you need uh, except for coloring. And they are self-sticking and they stick very well. They are also very easy to color. Once you uh, apply them, blend the edges and seal it, you can use almost any coloring technique to be, you know, a Pax Paint, an RMG, inks, you know, anything you want to you normally use, you can. I'm also guessing that these are great for makeup artists to just have in their kit just in case they get asked to do something last minute. Yeah, I, uh, you know what, I do have a couple of people that, you know, they keep them on hand, you know, because it's a prosumer product, so, you know, they can be used for high depth projects and, you know, they, they work out really well as just like generic cuts, a generic scar. I mean, they've appeared on, you know, multiple TV shows and, you know, again, it's, it's really easy to have. That's cool. How do they compare price-wise? I believe I was the first one to provide these type of prosthetics. The market had already a few companies out there selling foam latex products or latex products, you know, in this prosumer range. But since I was going to be going in competition with these other products, um, I wanted to make sure that the price point was very similar so that it just kind of came down to what you were looking for artistically rather than price. That makes sense. And do you do custom orders? Yes, uh, we can do custom orders. Every once in a while, I'll get a, you know, a show that calls me and says, hey, I need to do this, you know, and I need this gash and, you know, and a Z shape or whatever. So yeah, it always depends on scheduling of the show, scheduling of uh, your needs but um, it definitely can happen. Very cool. Hey, so you also have another product that you sell called Ultimate. Tell me about that. I sure do. Um, <laughs> Ultimate is a mattifying agent, but also works well for face prep, lash primer, or a barrier cream. It's kind of like a whitish cream, but I found it ideal to work on many skin tones because it does go clear. And over time, like if you're working on an actor who's hot, who's sweaty, and you keep applying and applying and applying, uh, it, it doesn't go chalky. I found that it does not uh, build up. Um, it, it just disappears. That's awesome. And how is it over? A wig lace. Uh, you know what? I have used this over wig lace, mm-hmm. much to the chagrin of the hair people that I work with sometimes. But <laughs> you, you know, but I have found that it, it works well, and it, it, it goes on and it does dry, so yeah. it doesn't affect any adhesion as well. Yeah, that's that's my main concern normally. So you mentioned just before that you use it as a barrier cream and for skin prep. Do you want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I was working on a show one time where I had an actor, an older gentleman who had a very a tender skin and we were using prosthetic transfers on him and they stick really well and the derma shield itself as a barrier wasn't enough so what we ended up doing was putting the ultimat on top of the derma shield applying the prosthetics uh, it did not affect the adhesion of the prosthetics but at the end of the day it did make the prosthetics come off a lot easier for a 
face prep slash primer, I know the makeup team on one of the live dancing shows, they'd been using it on their dancers as a primer. They told me that it helped the makeup stay put as well as it kept the face looking more matte. Absolutely. And I'm sure they, you know, they've got a full fashion face of makeup on. So, and all that dancing and sweating. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to keep it on. That's awesome. So it's an all round pretty great product. Yeah. Yeah. And so how can people get hold of your products? For the guy, Flesh prosthetics go to my website gotflesh.com and you can also pick it up at Nigel Beauty Emporium for the Ultimat uh, mattifying cream you can get it from the gotflesh.com online store or you can pick it up in person at Nigel's Beauty Emporium or Friends Beauty A both in North Hollywood and for listeners of the Last Book podcast you go to the online store at gotflesh.com if you use the coupon code Last Looks Podcast, all one word, all caps, you'll get a 15% discount. That's awesome. Yay. Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> there you go. You bet. Thank you. Today, we speak with Maria Sandoval and Brian Sype about their hair and makeup work on season one of The Mandalorian. We chat about what it's like to be Star Wars fans and having the opportunity to create and design new characters within the Star Wars universe and what challenges they faced as a team. I have spoken. Pictures up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, guys. Hi, thanks for having us. Hi, hello. Now, you are the heads of department for hair and makeup on The Mandalorian. How did you become involved in the project? Brian, we'll start with you. Uh, you know what? Uh, I was working over at uh, Legacy FX and uh, finishing up a show, and John Rosengrant, who's one of the owners there, had mentioned that they were in talks with a, a new project and wondered if I would, you know, take some other stuff to set. They said it was a TV show and didn't really mention too much about it. And I had asked if they had crewed up yet. And mm-hmm. he said he didn't think so. So I just said, well, I, I don't want to just do the prosthetics. I want to do the whole thing. So he, you know, got me an interview with Colin Wilson, the executive producer, and, you know, went down, had the meeting and got hired. And in the meeting, did you find out what the job was? Uh, Yeah. I mean, there was actually like, as I started to get a little bit more information from John, um, Mm -hmm. he, you know, mentioned what it was. And that was, you know, that was the, oh, hell yes moment. Yeah. (laughs) I want um, this. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's when I was really like, okay, no, I want to, you know, I guys got to do the whole thing. Yeah. And for you, was that... Is that the first head of department job you've done where you've done like the special effects side, but also just the normal makeup side? Um, no, quite a few years ago, I had done like a, a Disney kids show, Disney XD kids show called Mighty Med. Okay. And, you know, I'd done the same thing there, department head for makeup and prosthetic makeup. Yeah. And I had department headed like the prosthetic sides of things for, for mm-hmm. a few films, you know, for like Guardians uh, 2, Infinity War, that yeah. kind of a thing, Captain Marvel. I just lately have been reaching out to try and grab more responsibility. Yeah, very cool. What about you, Maria? How did you become involved? I think Brian has more to tell before I enter the picture. (laughs) (laughs) I do. (laughs) Carry on. (laughs) Jeez, what should I be talking about? I mean, you know, there was, uh, I I guess, once I did get hired, it was, you know, hey, you know, let's let's assemble the team. I, I had no idea who I would get for, you know, hair department head. And my girlfriend uh, is also a hairstylist and was working with Maria on a project. And they got to talking and my girlfriend was, you know, pretty much let me know right away that she knew of somebody who'd be very interested in the job and would be perfect for the job. That's very cool. And in steps, Maria. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had no idea that, that this was happening. And I was working with uh, Jennifer Guerrero on a project and we were just sort of chit-chatting as we do. And I mentioned to her that I was kind of, you know, fed up with the things I'd been doing and sort of sick of day checking. And I said, you know, what I really enjoyed doing was working with Brian Sype that time because I had come to Atlanta to help them out on Infinity War. And I said, I really enjoy what he does. I like the way he does it. And it sounds like all of his jobs are really creative and interesting. And I think I'm ready to to do that again because I had stopped department heading um, eight years before when I'd had my daughter and I felt like I was kind of ready to jump back into into that pool and uh, she said well funny you should mention that because you know that's a thing and she kind of beat around the bush about what it was without exactly telling me but once I 
knew or figured it out, I was like, that's it. That job's mine. What do I have to do? Who do I have to kill? <laughs> and uh, when I met with Brian, I just basically told him, I was like, listen, dude, you can find 20 people with way bigger resumes than mine, especially right now, since I haven't been, been department heading for a while. I said, but you are not going to find anyone else in this city that has a broader range of the subject matter than I do, because I am just a crazy walking encyclopedia of Star Wars fanaticism. You know, I was just like, you know, you need to hire me or you're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> just putting it out there <laughs> that's what I was thinking and uh, then I just sort of let it go and went okay this is it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen and if it if it doesn't happen there was there was no way I wasn't going to work on it somehow you know I had to I had to get my my foot in the door but luckily he he believed me and he believed in me so that's so cool so um that was going to be one of my questions is uh, were you Star Wars fans um Maria I'm guessing that's a solid yes from you <laughs> and Brian I'm guessing I mean just what you do for a living you must have grown up loving Star Wars yeah I, I did you know I mean I was what 11 years old well, you know I think when the first one came out and you know that was it's that was you know not only life changing for me but the world. Uh, I mean, yeah. it was ne- neat to see just how it affected everything. I mean, you know, even if you go back and look now, and like, I mean, it, he changed movie making, at, you know, at that moment. And yeah, I'm a big fan, not as big as Maria, but I mean, you know, because I haven't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> delved so deep into it. But I mean, there was a time, you know, right after that one came out, and, and um, back when they had albums, I remember mm-hmm. a buddy of mine had uh, he got the album of. Uh, was like the story of star wars or something like that and it was kind of like this whole they took excerpts from the movie and put it onto this album and we used to play that and actually kind of act out the parts it's pretty funny of course Um, but uh (laughs) and i used to draw a lot when i was a kid so of course you know everything star wars you know was drawn at some point yeah so well you know it, it absolutely just just opened up everybody's eyes i think and mine you know to you know that that side of the fantasy world of makeup that you know you know, kind of drew me in. And so, Maria, how did you become such a big fan? Like what, I mean, I, I love Star Wars. I'm not in your caliber of fandom, but what happened? How, how, how did that start? Uh, well, the first film came out, I was actually only six years old. Yeah. But sister and I, because we lived in a small town, walked to the movie theater 14 times that summer to see the movie. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. <laughs> and I think it was just, sort of seeing things in a different perspective. I mean, like I said, we were in a small town that was very, sort of very closed off to a lot of things. We weren't in a big state. We didn't have a big city anywhere nearby. And now it's completely changed where I used to live. But I felt like I was finally taken somewhere else, I guess, you know, it was just like that, that escapism and that, yeah, you know, that the, everybody was, all the guys were handsome and the girl was a princess, but she didn't need rescuing. And, Everything was just so interesting and the music was so amazing. And I just started being more interested in stories, I think, at that point and how stories were told. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty magical for a six year old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, of course, you know, every few years another movie would come out and, you know, that would get even more and more exciting. And the mm-hmm. merchandise, I've always been a bit of a collector and a bit of a, you know, um, order of of props and things yeah well they do they do make some pretty cool stuff so (laughs) so uh, let me know did the man himself grace you with his presence on set george lucas he did he did did? was that a like holy shit (laughs) yeah maria's got the story on this one i'll do it maria go yeah yeah it it is a bit of a holy shit uh, it was a bit of a moment. Uh, John Favreau, who is is our one of our illustrious leaders, our main illustrious leader, I think kind of gets a kick out of fans working on his project. You know, about he, he really enjoys. You know, he asks everybody for their opinion, and he, you know, gets mm-hmm. excited and it's like, "Hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? Isn't this cool? Isn't this cool?" And he knows that I'm of a particular fan caliber. And the day that George was there, George and John Favreau and Dave Filoni, who's our other executive producer who is a huge big wig at Lucasfilm and does all the animation for the Clone Wars and Rebels. They were all sitting around the monitors having a talk about the Force. And of course, there were a bunch of us that were slowly, you know, creeping towards the monitor trying to 
hear every single word just straining, you know, to find out what they were saying. And uh, John just happened to be facing the crowd of gathering people. And he looked at me and he sort of crooked his finger and said, come here. And I came over and he, uh, he introduced me to George and told George what I did. And George was really nice and said, oh, I was just having a conversation with these guys about how important hair and makeup is and, you know, how it's something that films really really neat and sort of the unsung heroes of the set and um we just chatted for a little bit longer and you know then I walked away and basically crumpled into a giant pile yeah I was gonna say with shaky (laughs) shaky knees just like oh my god (laughs) did that just Uh, happen (laughs) yeah it was pretty amazing it was it was definitely one of the highlights of, of my life so far. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I find that in our line of work, I mean, we have to be pretty cool about who we're meeting and all that type of stuff. So, on the odd occasion that you have a fan moment, it's quite epic. Yeah, it doesn't happen that often, but every now and again, you're like, oh my god, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to hold it together with certain people, you know. I was, I was just like. Try to be, try to be cool. Try to be cool. Don't get <laughs> uh, Oh, and also because John kind of a little bit put me on blast. I think he was messing with me a little bit because he was mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, hey, George, um, ask Maria to show you her Star Wars tattoos. So, you know, there I am, you know, showing <laughs> He's thinking, oh, God, another one of those, you know. But he was really gracious and, and it was it was pretty cool. So working on the show with hair and makeup together, how important was it to you guys to work as a cohesive team? I mean, I, th- I think that's that's one of the most uh, important things. Yeah. You know, I, ha- I have worked on shows when, you know, people get adversarial, you know, department heads, and it's, it, it's, it just doesn't work. I mean, you know, part of that first meeting that Maria and I had, you know, was really just to kind of, uh, you know, I already knew that, you know, she could do the job. You know, I worked with her on Infinity War. You know, she did great work. But you know, more so, it's it's about you know who you're going to jive with. You know, there's some of the most talented people I know as a makeup artist. But you know, they're kind of a holes. So I, I don't. Mm-hmm. You know, it's too, it's too hard to work with that. You know, especially for you know something like this where you're in it for four months and you're seeing each other every day and you do yeah. have to have conversations and what are we going to do with this character what are we going to do with this and that was you know more so my first thought for that first meeting was just like you know is this somebody that i think i'm going to get along with yeah yeah when you're you know when you're on a contemporary show and you know jane doe comes through and gets her beachy waves and then she goes over and gets her you know glowy skin whatever i think hair and makeup departments are a little more separate but when you're doing something like this where you're creating characters both have input and if your vision doesn't jive with their vision it can get muddy and nasty and you don't want to have somebody that you're like well no i'm doing their hair this way no matter what i don't care what the makeup looks like you're going to have to adjust it to my vision that doesn't yeah doesn't work that way and and vice versa and and if i was doing something and it just wasn't quite wasn't quite there and brian had a suggestion he doesn't want it to be somebody that's got the kind of ego that's going to be like oh my god makeup's telling me what to do you know it's yeah it's a it's a collaboration and we tried to keep it that way on every level as much as possible absolutely yeah. teamwork and that kind of goes through with every, everybody in the crew you know i think we've yeah. you know over first season and second you know we've been able to assemble you know great crews that get that you know and want to come and play because it's you know well i mean one it's star wars and mm-hmm. two it's you know it's just like if you know it's, just, it's let's have fun you know, yeah. it doesn't have to be work. So, but, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's a lot of it too, I think. It's just, you know, trying not to make work work. So what other, what other things do you look for when you're growing up for something like that? So someone who can have a laugh and fun and gets along with other people, I guess is number one. For me, it's out of the box thinking. I mean, with, with makeup, there are, I mean, and with hair as well, but I think with makeup, there are like certain ways, you know, you put a prosthetic on a certain way, it has the steps have to be taken, this, that, and the other. I feel like sometimes with hair, there's like a thousand ways to get to Burbank. Yeah. I always say just get there, you know, quickly and safely and don't get in a wreck. And when you get there, make sure everything looks good. But we work with very strange craft materials, things with glue guns. We do things with zip ties. We, I mean, whatever we can do to make it work. And, and I don't want everybody to come in and just be like, well, it has to be brushed this way or it has to be combed this way or which direction do you, do you want the braid to go over or under? 
you know, um, I want people to just come in and, and sort of do free form and, and just play and enjoy. And often it can be hard to find people that do that, especially if they've been working under department heads that are really, really particular about the way things are exactly done. And I think, though, I think it's it's relaxing and it makes a really great environment for people because they do get to kind of play and, you know, create and learn and, learn and, and you know, come out of it doing something that they'd never done before that they'd never even considered doing. And I mean, it is it is that way. I'm sure Brian can, you know, attest to, to the makeup side of things. I'm sure there's things that they do that are unconventional, but I know definitely for hair that that's one of the things that I I try to look for in people. I don't want people that are real militant and rigorous and uh, I want a good work ethic and I want people that are going to, to do what needs to be done and show up on time. Yeah, it's a creative job. So get yeah. creative, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, awesome. and I mean, but it is but it is also a job, you know? So yeah. I mean, aside from just jiving, I mean, you know, talent is going to be, you know, something of important or at least like a like a base of talent and and mm -hmm. the ability to listen you know because again you know even for myself it, it's you know you can tell me what you want and I'll try and do it you know as best I can you know everybody's hands different everybody's sentiment is different and this has been you know <laughs> I've worked on a project where I basically did a demo and it's like okay this is what these makeups are going to be it's going to look like this and then do it and here's all the same things i just use here's all the same colors i just use you do it you know and you hand that out to 10 different people and you're going to get 10 different things yeah and, and you know just right after they watched you do something but as long as they're in kind of like an area you know like the cousins you know that's that's a cousin to this person you know kind of a thing and it's close yeah you know and I, i've obviously for anybody that i hire it's like i hired them because i've they're talented you know and learned a lot to just let go and and for myself and not be so rigid in what to expect you know even though it's not what i would have done it's not how yeah. i would have approached it but as long as it's still within the world and the universe of what we need absolutely and i think too that when you kind of loosen with that type of thing and you can then feel comfortable sharing like oh hey well how about we try this how about we try that exactly. and you've got a team of people that are happy to do it and don't get their back up like what what don't you like about it yeah 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 <laughs> um it just all works so much smoother it's just so much more more enjoyable yeah, you know i mean because for myself and maria i mean you know we're there you know guiding the boat again yeah listening you know it's just yeah. a matter of it's like okay yeah you know well, how about push this pull this back you know and, and as long as you can find somebody who's willing to do that um you know, then you got the makings of a good team. That's awesome. Hey, I know that on projects like this, they can have a design team that's like purely dedicated to character concepts and stuff. So was that happening on this show? Were you getting images of what had, you know, someone had already done and then working off those for particular characters? For some of the stuff we did, there was uh, one of the, the main designers for the show, Doug Chang. He was involved in, you know, they, him and his team would, would do images of the, of the main characters or, yeah. you know, uh, some of the stuff like that. When it came to everybody else, that was kind of something that was left up to us, you know, Maria and myself to do. So you know, we went into our own little design phase, putting together vision boards and, you know, trying yeah. to you know, see what we could start putting together. And that's something that we did for one of our initial meetings with Favreau and Filoni. That's great. So after reading script and putting some design stuff together, that's awesome. So which of the characters were you guys responsible for design wise? Yeah, there were quite yeah, a few yeah. that came like masks and things that came literally from Lucasfilm that came from England that were like sort right. of published things that were pure just masks that you know we didn't touch but then brian also made masks too at one point so you know they got to dip their toes into the into those characters but for hair you know it was just any obviously anybody that that had hair on their head we had to we had to figure out a look for that's awesome so someone like cara dune was she someone that that had like a concept for and then you follow through with that or did it change in the design process? One of the cool things about this process, the way they do this is they have the entire show is pre-visualized in animation form, like roughed out animation. And you can watch almost the entire episode sort of in this rough form before it's ever, ever even shot. And so for the previs, when they started originally, they had, you know, drawn up these different characters and they'd drawn them up in certain kind of, I guess, ways based on their descriptions in the script. And they had Cara Dune as this, you know, bulky, muscled, sort of strong 
almost a little butch woman with uh, her head, hair was shaved on the sides and very, very short on the top. And I think it was blue or purple or something. And it was, you know, obviously strong and, and gave you a sense of who the character was right away. But once we, you know, got into actually designing her look and spoke with John and Dave and, and the actress Gina Carano, that wasn't something that they were all comfortable with doing, especially Gina. And so we had to kind of go a slightly different direction and, you know, work through some some different ideas and uh, eventually came to a happy point with her. Yeah, but it looks was very cool. You know, there's there were there were a few days where she came in for hair and makeup testing, and we did different things. And she had her hair colored, and she had her hair cut, and you know, we had to had to do some give and take as far as the look was concerned to get it to where the actress was comfortable, and also to where the to where the producers and and director was, were happy with with what the final look was. Yeah, finding that sweet spot. That's but, awesome. Um, to, to more pointedly, I guess, answer your question, there was, yeah. for that one meeting that Ray and I had with um, Filoni and Favreau, you know, we put together, you know, a big black binder of images to take down to them and just kind of like, you know, see the bookends of where we were going to build our characters, you know, because we have, you know, there's tons of background, there's tons of everything, you know, when you go into the Bounty Hunter bar on mm. Navarre, you know, I mean... All of that stuff wasn't designed by production. It was it was stuff that, you know, we collectively just kind of put together images, you know, like I would be putting together face and head and shapes and you know, Maria was, you know, gathering, you know, hair designs and, and we had an artist that combined them where it's like, Yeah, how about this hairstyle on this face and you know, on this alien and this um and try and, uh, you know, just create this whole big lookbook. That's very cool. And then, you know, sat down at the meeting and had them go through and, you know, they just thumbed through the pages and went like, yep, nope, yep, nope. Or, you know, that's too Star Trek. Nope, that's not good enough. You know, this is Star Wars. This is Star Wars. That's, you know, Battlestar Galactica. That's, you know, um, <laughs> and they kind of, uh, you know, gave us our parameters. And then from there, you know, we just kind of started work. Yeah. That's very cool. So, I mean, yeah, because you're going into the, the bar, there's the people from all different planets and stuff, right? Different worlds. Yeah, so yeah. you've got a full range of, well, toys to play with. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> that's very fun. So which of the characters from season one did you absolutely love creating that you were just, when you'd finished it and hit that sweet spot, you were like, yes, this is cool. For a lot of the bounty hunters, we felt that way about. I mean, there were days where we were just like, "This is so cool! Look at what we did!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, I'd say well, Cara Dune, um, but Fennec Shand. Fennec was was really, really fun for me. Oh, with all the uh, the intricate braiding and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. When we when we first had her on, you know, she was a one and done. She was going to be in one episode and be and be um, killed. So it was like we could do something kind of fun and crazy and take a little bit of time in the chair, you know, not too much, but we had to figure out a way to make, to streamline it. But it was something that we knew was going to be, you know, had to make an impact quickly and within one episode and be, you know, visually interesting. And then, and then we weren't going to have to do it every single day for like the rest of the season. So we <laughs> yeah. had to do something a little fun and cool and, and she was up for it. And, you know, we, that was a bit of a collaboration too, because she wanted her hair to, to emulate a, a fennec fox's ears and so we sort of came up with this triangular braiding look and uh, incorporated some of the colors from her costume into it with lacing and uh, it turned out really really fun oh that's so cool i love how actors just bring that into the mix of you know the ear the, the fox ear shape and just little things like that it's just it's magic i love it what about you brian I mean, the bounty hunter days were were definitely it. I mean, you know, because a lot of the a lot of the shows, you know, we would have you know some different people that we would focus on, you know, whether it be you know Carl's character's grief or Amy Sedaris's Ellie Moto. But when we did the bounty hunter bar scenes, I mean, I mean, even to precursor that, like what we would do, like the one thing Filoni and Favreau really liked to do was to do um, makeup tests, you know, just like the a full looks test. And so yeah. one of the first times that we did that, you know, I think we had we had like a dozen of them up there or something like that. And it was just everything from, you know, extravagant looking humans to, you know, some of the, the aliens that we, you know, aliens and or the, any of the bounty hunters, you know, to the, the mall characters. We were, you know, sitting there on stage, you know, with the camera pointed at all of these people. It was 
just one of those mm-hmm. times when you just you just had to smile yeah and, and and just be like yeah this is why we're here you know this it's like this you know it's for these moments yeah. um, where you can just look at this and you know it's pretty cool i mean i, th- I think the, the the first bounty hunter bar stuff was, was pretty fun i mean just because it also harkened back to you know the cantina scene or something like oh. that that really drew you into that show totally like what are all these creatures <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it was it towards the beginning of the shoot too so it really kind of got us to get yes. our, our our feet wet and feel you know get a feel and then we can also start you know world building at that point because we were kind of creating a, a vibe that was going to continue mm. the rest of the show even though we weren't going to have those kind of big scenes anymore we sort of knew what we wanted everything to, to look and feel like and we had you know so many creative incredible people helping us out and some of the you know things that came together were were pretty magical and and you know to this day already characters that people have you know, picked out of the mix, so to speak. I guess this happens a lot, and with Star Wars fans, is that even sometimes background characters become fan favorites and beloveds. And you know, there might be mm-hmm. might be seeing some action figures or who knows what. <laughs> yeah, and some person it's... that was in a swipe, you know, in in one scene. I love that. It's so nice that you had the prep to be able to do those tests and everything like that. Like, I I mean, in our world, we always think it's needed, but it's nice that um, production saw the value in doing that as well that's awesome i mean john's uh you know favreau is, is is pretty much especially with this first season i think there was a lot of egg walking just because you know it was the first time that you know anything of this nature has been done over here you know in the united states yeah so i, th- I think it was definitely something that he moved forward carefully because he wanted to make sure you know like him and Filoni really wanted to make sure that everything that we did was Star Wars and, you know, felt like it, even though we were doing, you know, like Maria mentioned, you know, we're, we're, you know, world building, but we're on the other side of the universe, you know, we're on, we're supposed to be on a side that, you know, the, and years after the rebellion. So the empire's gone, people are poor, people are not as well off. And so it was, it was fun to make characters that had to still feel Star Wars, but just a little bit different. Yeah. Hey, I just want to go back to, you mentioned Amy Sedaris's character. Now, Maria, that hair gave me so much joy. (laughs) (laughs) I just, she looks so adorable. The curly little brown mullet. Like I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, that was really, um, you know, it was funny when we, when we found out Amy was going to be on the show, we knew we had an opportunity to do something a little wacky because she's Amy. And so Wendy Southerd, who's my key, and I both have a crazy affinity for mullets. I don't know what it is. We just, we love a good mullet. Lady, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> We started thinking about ideas for her character. I said, oh, my God, what if she had a friggin' rock and space mullet? And we were like, yes. So we, <laughs> we sent off some emails to Amy and said, you know, what are you interested? These are some ideas we had. What do you think of a space mullet? And she just wrote back and was like, yes, I'm in. Oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. So Wendy took the reins with that one. And we found this Cal East full lace wig that was just that wrong ashy gross brown color that's just so muted mm-hmm. and boring and when he permed it and it was just it was it was magical what can i say a lot of people have compared it to ripley which i think is really interesting um, <laughs> but um but hey, but it, that's, I guess that's, that's fun but no yeah it just totally worked and then and then uh you know alexi dimitrio who did her makeup uh they did a, a, a no eyebrow look and so it just got even weirder and weirder and- i noticed that that was very cool um and i'm i'm glad to hear it was permed i had a feeling that was a perm i mean how could it not be <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful <laughs> I loved it. So on season one, while shooting, what what's the, like the biggest challenge you think you kind of came across? I think for, definitely for me, and I think for both of us, we had, not exactly sure. I mean, you know, there's always a mystery to why things get scheduled um, oh, the way that yeah. they do. But mm-hmm. of course, I think it was, I think we were in Navarre, but like our very first day of shooting, we had a ton of background it was like it was like a huge day it wasn't like a a slow ramp up to like oh we just got like a couple of you know characters here and there it was yeah we had like 25 people that we had to do and you know big i mean so um 
you know, to, to start off the whole thing with the Big Bang like that and, you know, early calls and, and, and just to try and to go yeah. through that. Um, that I remember being, you know, <laughs> just like, really? Why? Yeah. No, I feel like it's, it happens. So, I feel like it happens so often. I feel like it's, it's just like a conscious decision that someone who loves to see people, you know, running around with their heads cut off, just is like, yeah, yeah let's just make that first day massive. We'll just I, throw yeah, everything yeah, at yeah. them and, you know, they'll swim or sink kind of thing. And it's just it, like, oh, guys, come on. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, it was always, but it was like all over the place too. And I think because we also had like a huge, massive day like that. I think with a bunch of the bounty hunters the last day before Christmas break. Mm -hmm. And then the day coming back was, you know, part two of that whole scene. So it was, you know, no, like heading off into the sunset on your Christmas break or coming back easy. It was like, you know, boom, boom. Yeah. And from a staffing perspective, and I'm sure Jamie Lee, you'll, you'll, you can attest to this, especially, I mean, there are so many talented makeup people and and they have such a large roster and for hair, you know, it's been so busy and we were asking people to, you know, get there at three 45 in the morning. And Oh, by the way, it's Manhattan beach. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, it's, you know, first season rate. (laughs) And uh, you're like, please, it'll be fun. I promise. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, not everybody's like, Oh, it's star Wars. I'll be there. I mean, there's quite a few people who Mm. feel that way, but there's other people, you know, there was so many amazing productions going on at the same time all those ryan murphy things and all these period shows and just trying to get people to staff those days and to get consistent people to staff those days was just yeah you know, ridiculous and then you know you're doing 14 16 hour day and you're in manhattan beach and then people have to go home at rush hour and it's you know three hours in the car and it's just it's incredibly from that perspective it was very very difficult you know to keep the quality and consistency up the people that you were hiring to to do those days yeah. Luckily, luckily for the makeup side, we're all a bunch of nerds into this stuff, so yeah. it's easier for me. I can't tell you how many people, hair people, would come and be like, "Uh, yes, yeah, so I've never seen Star Wars," and it was like, "What? What? Yeah. <laughs> how are you a human being? Yeah. I don't understand." What? <laughs> Yeah. We, speaking of human beings, we have one particular uh, makeup artist who has gone through as you know a, a nice important player on the makeup team, season one and two, and she had mm. not seen a single Star Wars movie. No. <laughs> she's only seen them now in the pandemic since she's at home forced to watch something. It's like Samantha, me. yeah, <laughs> oh, you out, Samantha Ward. <laughs> Well, at least she's redeemed herself and has yeah. now, has she seen everything? <laughs> I believe so. And I believe she was starting to Clone Wars as yep. well. So. Yep, okay. Wow. Clone Wars, so. so she must be enjoying it then. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> or have you just made her watch it, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, I think you know the COVID made her watch it. So yeah, of course. <laughs> COVID induced Star Wars fanaticism. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so I know you have like you you have your main characters and you give, have that time to design and you know things are coming through. But like, how often were things kind of just being thrown at you, kind of last minute ish throughout the shoot? No, that that happens all the time too. Even especially, it's like we might have done something you know or created a character and and walked out into like a makeup test for john or dave to see and they would be like "Mm, yeah no (laughs) you know and but we still needed so many people to to fill these seats it's adjusting things and um oh and then we need uh, we're gonna put five zabrax in tomorrow and by the way the guys that you already fitletics on aren't available so we're gonna just get some random dudes and then they show up and haven't shaved their heads and won't shave their heads and uh, <laughs> that kind of stuff. But even for somebody like, you know, for, you know, someone like Favreau, I mean, he'll, he'll come up and, you know, they'll think of just something, you know, like, um, you know, for Cara Dune, you know, we had done the tests, we had done, you know, the hair test went successfully, the makeup test went successfully. And I remember, and then all of a sudden he was, he came up and was like, how about if we have a little, you know, teardrop type tattoo on our face? And, you know, so it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So it's, it's new stuff that, you know, it's just, you know, things that, you know, you're at the beck and call sometimes and, yeah. um, you know, and need to be able to mobilize and move fast. So how are you prepping for those occasions? Like, especially with the character, like full prosthetic kind of alien type 
looks how were you just did you have like all sorts of pieces that you had set aside so you could create if need be we did have some stuff like that i mean you know some of the full fully realized characters the main characters like mithril yeah you know that was something that was initially designed through doug chang and then uh, legacy effects they were contracted to build it so then there was kind of like a redesign to make it you know fit like a makeup wood and then we built the makeup up there that was all done pre you know, before we even started shooting. I mean, as we got into building the stuff for the bounty hunter bar, say, I mean, that was just all stuff that we were just doing in the trailer. We were, you know, sculpting, I was sculpting little pieces and we would mold stuff or, you know, we would do our actors, you know, I think we were working on, we shot all out of order. So um, Mm -hmm. we were shooting the first episode and while that was happening, somebody would cover set and then I would go back to the trailer and start building something. Or Maria would go back and she would start braiding, you know, for hair pieces for like for the next episode or what was coming up. We didn't have the luxury of having a huge team of people behind us, mm. um, you know, making all this stuff. It was just, you know, okay, there's here's a, here's a spare five, ten minutes. What can I do in that time? But I was going to add to that. There are often many, many scenes, if not entire episodes on our show, where it's just a man in a helmet and a puppet. I was going to say something about that because uh, just because I'm in this line of work also, when I'm watching something and I see that there's a whole bunch of people wearing helmets, I'm like, ooh, is that a quieter day for everybody? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I think that was really kind of the only way that we were able to get through this first season just because we were, you know, you know, we didn't have huge shops of people helping us build stuff. So, I mean, you know, we had to do it ourselves and, and, and it, that actually gave us you know, some time to do that. Yeah, that's great. But also the fact that you guys are running departments, but at the same time you're getting to go on set, you're getting to go back to the trailer and prep stuff. Like there's a nice variety within your day, which is, I mean, I know I love doing that kind of stuff. So that must have been really nice. Yeah, Yeah, you get your your steps in, that's for sure. (laughs) I'm sure, absolutely. And that first season we did it all literally in the trailer. By the second season we had... We had prep rooms and, and, you know, more space to actually have our things. But we were, you know, we're we're a department in one trailer with all that stuff. One aid station trailer. Yeah. <laughs> a, that's, guys, that's, that's rough. I had literally a closet <laughs> in between the dressing rooms, which is where the wigs were. So if, every time you needed a wig, you had to go to the closet. And then you had to move all the Mando <laughs> costumes out of the way because the people would put the costumes right in front of the closet. And then you had to get in the closet and get the wig out. And, uh, yeah. Hit the big time, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things that you can just find to be the biggest struggles I think sometimes it's just like I just need more space mm. can I just have more time and space yeah. that would be amazing <laughs> and as much as we complain about that you know I also feel like it would have really it was we great this season this second season we had our own separate rooms where we could do a lot of prep and stuff and that was fantastic but yeah the the idea of having two separate trailers which we've bounced around every year i don't know that it would work yeah it'd be great space wise but on the mm. other hand i think half of the reason the collaborations work so well is that you're right there together right? yeah right doing work so you move that around and it's you know things don't happen quite as smoothly yeah that's true i mean there there's other times where you know it's just you know whether it's you know hey maria come up here what do you think of this and you're you know just kind of bat that around to get each other's opinions and was uh, very much afforded in that small space yeah that's very true so what was it like having different directors coming through were there adjustments that they were making themselves or anything like that or they just kind of had to go with the flow of what was already created character wise a little bit of both i mean you know again favreau and filoni are pretty much the the great driving creative force for this show itself the voice of god yeah they prove it that it's done you know right but of course you know with different directors everybody did want to come in and you know kind of you know and 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 favreau and filoni also did want to make sure that they were heard as well you Mm -hmm. know when it came back and circled around it was obviously you know going to be their you know their word you know, it was it was kind of, you know, if they put their foot down, it was what it was. But, you know, like Bryce, she came in to do uh, episode four. She had a lot of input and, you know, had a lot of ideas. She's very enthusiastic. Yeah, I think Bryce was a really good example of that because I think she was, you know, Cara Dune was an introduced in Bryce's episode. And, okay. and Bryce had a big part in coming up with that 
character and that look and and she had a lot of ideas and a lot of input and it was definitely important to have her there and they really respected what she had to say and what her ideas were and some of the other directors like i said just you know had guys in helmets and puppets (laughs) brian did you take care of any of the puppet side of things or is that like a different department that comes in and does that that's a different department uh like a gsx does that i mean they built the child and, um, you know, and anything that came back that was an old asset from England, like some of the droids or any of the mechanical heads for some of the more sophisticated creatures, the legacy effects ran. Oh, nice. So the I Have Spoken guy? Yeah, Quill. Yeah, Quill. Did you guys, you didn't have anything to do with, with that little dude? No, no. Again, that was legacy effects. Misty Rosas plays that character. And I mean, you know, we helped out, you know, with, you know, coloring around the eyes. Um, okay. it's, a, it's a fully mechanical head, you know, with the actor eyes exposed so wow that's crazy i thoroughly enjoyed that character i have to say that i have spoken i was just like why have i not been saying that for my entire life (laughs) 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 like come on any parent should absolutely take that on board i think yeah 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 We don't let Brian say that. Or it's, it's, it's <laughs> Anyone else, but not you, Brian. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so throughout the shoot, was there a product or tool that you found yourself using every day and just, I mean, I know there's many, but was there just one that you're like, this is a godsend. Thank goodness I have this. I used a good old fashioned Topsy Tail a lot. What is that? You know what Topsy Tail is? It's like a plastic... A uh, piece of plastic with a big loop at one. Oh, the loop. Oh, through. okay. Yeah. Because we were threading twine a lot through pair or threading braid, just different uses for that tool, which I find very uh, handy. So it's like a big sewing needle really, isn't it? For here. Yeah, but a plastic yeah. one. Yeah. But a plastic one. Yeah. yeah. My other go-to tool in my arsenal, which is actually really hard to find, surprisingly people don't make them, is it's like a half round flat iron. It's basically, it's a flat iron, but it has a little tiny bevel to it, a little tiny curve to it. Okay. So you can get really close to the root and just provide lift or just give texture to hair. Everything in this world is very textured. Nobody has real sleek, smooth, like blowouts or beach yeah. waves or anything like that. So anything that would give texture, like a tiny crimping iron, you use a lot of the really, really small crimping iron too. Mm-hmm. Just to nice. Make hair more of a textile sort of a look. Absolutely. Because I mean, that's all through the costumes and everything too, isn't it? All the different textures and stuff. Um, what about you, Brian? I mean, I guess one of the main tools, you know, that us makeup artists use, or even sometimes whether we're doing a prosthetic makeup or not, might be the airbrush. I use the Pache H airbrush, you know, which I think is a great workhorse, inexpensive, and it's just, you know, you can hammer with it. You can, you know, use it to pry open whatever you need, and it still just keeps working. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, because in in this place where we were, you know, wanted to dirty up people a lot because it's a little poorer side of the universe. So one good fast way to do that is put a color in there that you can kind of smudge up people with and just do a really quick translucent pass over people, and it just kind of takes that clean off. Yeah, just getting that layer in there. Yeah, yeah. Airbrush for us, too. We used uh, Temp2, the little airbrush, the little handheld airbrush pro. Yeah. And for scalps, because we did so much braiding. And it's mm. distracting to see that really bright, shiny scalp, especially if it's, you know, yeah. you're trying to create kind of a more a more rugged, dirty braid, so to speak. You can just knock it down a bit. It's such an easy little tool. Don't make a black color, which I wish they would. But. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I also, I find, like, because I, before the temp do came along, of course, I was just using my liquid inks and stuff like that. But it never, the hair always feels so, so strange afterwards, even if you put a little shine in it or or whatever and i'm just waiting for somebody to come out with a product that doesn't cost the earth and is easy just to put through your normal airbrush that stays but i just don't even know if it exists but just a little more malleable maybe i don't know if you guys have any tips on how (laughs) i can use my inks but make it not feel so stiff and nasty in the hair yeah well luckily for us we were just using it on scalps and it didn't matter that it was matte and kind of messy dirty yeah a lot of um dry shampoo anyway just to dull hair down we didn't want it to look you know shiny or pretty or and in those cases if it was braided anyway the malleability didn't really matter because you do it after the braid so yeah but yeah it it, it can make the hair kind of weird i think someone needs to come up with a line of pens so drawing pens that have hair color anybody out there do this um (laughs) so i can use them (laughs) 
because you know how when we're doing like, you know, you want to put a few greys in someone's hair and you've got the silver and white pens, it would be great to have a range of hair colours to be able to do that with so you could put highlights in and, you know, all sorts of stuff. That'd be yeah. amazing. That stay like the silver and white pens do and have mm. the um, the shimmer and shine to them so they're not flat. Yeah, I was going to say you could use Posca pens, but Posca pens are very, very flat. That's, yeah. And then if it's too shimmery, then you've got metallics. And- mm. Anywho, so somebody, come on. Um- <laughs> But um, who would you like to hear on the podcast, guys? This is a makeup and hair podcast, correct? Huh? It certainly is. I mean, you know, there's there's so many people to, to pick from, I think, in our industry. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, I think it's a little bit more interesting maybe to hear. I mean, you know, like we are like in, we're the trench workers. So mm-hmm. I, I find, you know, that that's pretty good. Anybody from any of our crews. I mean, Alexi Dimitri is my key he was the key on the show. You know, he's got his own line of uh, tattoos. Would be somebody great to talk to just because that's, you know, he can come at it from that aspect as as well as doing designs, um, you know, an iPad. Um, yeah, I think he'd be a good person. That's awesome. I think it'd be interesting to hear from someone who's not a department head. I think there are some people in our industry who are professional day checkers that work on so many productions and do so much amazing work that just run the gamut that it'd be interesting to hear from their perspective how they gear up for each job, you know, what they have in their kit, what they find that's important, you know, for all, doing all the different periods, that sort of thing. I mean, there's some people that are on every show you ever heard of. You look and there, there's their name. I mean, there is an art to it. So absolutely. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. It's been Ace chatting with you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. For links to see more of Maria and Brian's work, go to our Instagram at The Last Looks Podcast or in our episode notes on our website, www.thelastlookspodcast.com. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.